I always thought tennis players were filthy rich. Turns out that was only half the truth, and as the saying goes, half-truths are the darkest of all lies. Most players actually lose money from playing tennis, so just how much does an 800th ranked player or 300th ranked guy make in comparison to the top 100, top 50? We'll uncover every detail about the financial life of pro tennis players, from prize money and tournaments, to sponsorships, endorsements, team competitions, even part-time jobs. Behind the scenes and away from the glitz and glamour of the four Grand Slam tournaments, and to a lesser extent, the rest of the ATP tournaments, you may find a player like 800th ranked Alexander Donsky competing on the red clay of the ITF Germany F-17 singles for a prize pot of just $15,000. You don't get to see too many spectators at such events. And just so you know, the ITF organizes 550 of these events across 70 countries. And it mainly incorporates two prize money levels, the 15K and the 25K. The ITF Pro Circuit is the lowest level of professional tennis, and although the name 15K or 25K sounds like a cool amount of money to make in just one week of playing tennis, it is actually a facade. Because even if you win the tournament, you'll barely take home 15% of the money. This is what the typical 25K tournament gets you. 25 ATP points and prize money of $3,600 for the winner, 16 ATP points and $2,120 for the runner-up, 8 points and $1,255 for semifinalists, and 3 points and $740 for quarterfinalists. 1 point and $430 if you reach the second round, and no points but $260 for playing the first round. It gets even worse for doubles players, who get to share a meager $1,550 for winning the title. Still, players often compete in both singles and doubles to maximize their earnings. A player like 25-year-old Alexander Donsky is no pushover. He has won two ITF World Tour singles and 10 doubles titles since turning pro in 2017, and he certainly has the passion and drive for the game. His total prize money at the moment is over $100,000, but what if I told you that Alexander Donsky was actually losing money by playing pro tennis? As a matter of fact, the American-born Bulgarian player often talks about what he has to endure to succeed. For instance, he has his cousin as his coach, and that helps to save some costs. How much does it cost to compete at tennis events at this level? I'll tell you. For simplicity's sake, let's give the average international round-trip flight a modest $1,000. Hotel accommodation might cost around $500 for the entire duration of the tournament, but many lower-ranked players share accommodations to save costs, so let's say a player spends $250. Some players might even have to stay with families of locals because they can't afford the 250. And if you're like Dustin Brown, yes, the guy who beat Rafael Nadal twice in 2014 and 2015, you might be sleeping inside a van. You see, in order to cut down on both travel and accommodation costs, Brown's parents bought him a Volkswagen camper van, which he drove in, slept in, and cooked in while he went on the tours between 2004 and 2007. Then we've got food, which might cost you around $200. Players then pay $40 for entry fees into the tournaments. So that's about $1,500 to just compete in one event, and that's literally the prize money for winning doubles at this level. Does it make sense? Winning doesn't even guarantee that you'll break even. It's why 717th ranked New Zealand player Kiran Paul Panu earned $6,771 in prize money, but his expenses, predominantly for travel, cost $34,500. He had to find other ways to make money on the side, primarily through short coaching stints, and to save money, such as sharing accommodations with fellow players and even going without health insurance. Now, European players like Alex have an edge because many events are held in Europe, so moving around might be a little easier Easier, but still, Alex has had to travel to South Africa, Qatar, and other areas outside Europe. He has competed in 33 events in the last 52 weeks. Going by our estimate, a player would probably spend around $35,000 to $45,000 even when trying to save costs. How much has Alex made again in his entire career? Remember, he turned pro six years ago. So without sponsors, grassroots funding such as pro scholarships, or a huge financial backup somewhere else, it is impossible for many players to survive. It's something that British world number 123 Liam Brody has already been through. Players also need a hitting partner and don't even get me started on professional coaching fees. 
players might have to share a coach or make do without one to cut costs, but I'll let that slide. Now how about racket and stringing costs? Former German tennis player Benjamin Becker stopped harboring any thoughts of having a proper professional career until a benefactor appeared and decided to sponsor his return to the tour. It was the famous coach Tariq Benhabilis who had worked with Andy Roddick. Luckily, Becker would beat Andre Agassi in the American's last match at the US Open and reach a career-high world number 35, but not everyone would be lucky like Benjamin. But on the bright side, if you manage to make deep, consistent runs at the futures level, you could gather enough ranking points to qualify for a challenger event. Challenger events come with more, bigger prize earnings and have the potential to help players break even in their financial situation. Many challenger tournaments draw small crowds of fans and are a significant step up from the futures circuit. A player like 125th ranked Liam Brody made a living competing professionally majorly on the challenger circuit before his breakthrough in 2020. As a junior, he made the finals of Wimbledon in the US Open in singles and won two majors in doubles. Brody had more significant coaching opportunities and sponsorships than Alex Donsky. For a player like Brody, the British Lawn Tennis Association estimates that it costs almost $400,000 to develop a player from when he's five years old until he turns 18. And even at that, these players also get clothing and racket sponsors and train in private tennis academies. Liam Brody spent some time training at the prestigious Muratoglu Academy in the south of France. Liam's expenses are a bit similar to players on the Futures Tour, but for someone who literally breathes tennis and has no other option, he has to make ends meet, somehow. Let me take you back to 2021, when Brody won his first Challenger title after losing in seven straight finals. The prize money for the Challenger Biel tournament, which Liam won 45,730 euros, he actually received a fraction of that amount. But that's not the point. The exciting part about the Challenger Tour is that it gives players the opportunity to sneak into the ATP main draw, or even potentially a Grand Slam. That's when you literally hit the jackpot. Brody has done that a couple of times. At Wimbledon this year, he defeated Kasper Ruud in the second round before losing to Denis Shapovalov in the third. And guess how much he made? $166,907 for one week's worth of effort. Er, but when you remember that tournament taxes are usually around 30%, or even higher in the case of Wimbledon, and that Liam Brody is a top player who has to pay good money for coaching, the amount isn't so great after all. Now, the ATP has listened to some of our complaints and made many reforms. For instance, starting from this year, the total prize pool in the Challenger circuit has been raised by 60% to a grand total of $21.1 million. That's a $7.9 million increase over 2022. We also now have four categories, the Challenger 50, 75, 100, and 125, as well as three premium 175 tournaments with prize money of $220,000. More events have also been added to give players more opportunities. Still, there's no doubt that the wealth in tennis is concentrated at the top, and Liam knows that. He agrees that the best players deserve the most money. Although challenger tournaments might allow players to stay afloat for a while, they must avoid injuries and losing streaks as much as possible. 29-year-old Liam Brody has made a total of $1,775,910 in prize money throughout his career, but how much did 20-year-old Carlos Alcaraz make by winning Wimbledon? $2,745,000. $1,726. Top tennis players make in two weeks what many athletes make in a year, and they make a lot more money throughout the year as well. But at the end of the day, only 97 players, 58 men and 39 women, made over $1 million on court in 2022. However, prize money is just one of the ways to make money in tennis. Bonuses. Top players also make money through bonuses. You get to make hundreds of thousands of dollars for just finishing in the top 10, and there are also guaranteed appearance fees for the very best. Appearance fees. Another way tennis stars at the pinnacle of their career make money is by simply showing up. Roger Federer's appearance fee at the Swiss indoors was more than double what the winner of the tournament received. Top players already have so many ranking points and might not need to play the smaller ATP tournaments, but appearance fees give them more incentive to participate. It's quite understandable why tournament directors are willing to pay so much. They get to sell more tickets and make more money with the top players around. It's the same thing with the exhibition or non-competitive matches. As a top Top player, you also get to partner with global brands thanks to your influence and celebrity status that comes with the ranking. These sponsorship deals often exceed the prize money that the players make. In 2022, Roger Federer earned a total of $90 million. How many matches did he play? None, except the Labor Cup. So most of the money came from his sponsorships with the likes of Rolex, Credit Suisse, and Uniqlo. Also, Naomi Osaka earned $56.2 million last year, but only $1.2 million of that income came from tournament play. 
the rest of the money, mostly from her marketing appeal. The not-so-good thing about sponsorships is that it sometimes depends on the country where the player's from. In countries like Spain, tennis is a major sport, and the presence of a large number of fans gives sponsors more incentive to collaborate with players. At some point in his career, Japanese tennis player Kei Nishikori was making over $30 million a year in sponsorship deals, while higher-ranked players from other countries didn't even earn one-tenth of that amount. An interesting thing about sponsorship earnings is that they're taxed by the country of residence, unlike prize money, which is taxed by the country where the tournament is held. Wondering why the majority of top players live in Monte Carlo, Switzerland? These places are literally tax havens, where players are allowed to keep most of their earnings compared to other countries. Investments Top players like Rafael Nadal own an academy. Djokovic owns the Joko Life Project, just to name a few. Getting to the pinnacle of the sport offers you a leeway to numerous investments that would make life after retirement easy. Club Tennis Lower-ranked players with at least one ATP ranking point can participate in club or league tennis at various levels and make decent money through wages, guaranteed lesson income, or a flat fee. Others Other ways to earn a few bucks might include going into college coaching, junior performance training, taking hitting partner gigs, and so on. But to be honest, this doesn't do much. It's hard to compete at the highest level with all that distraction. Let's now take the next minute to address the two major problems of tennis. Being an individual sport of all the major professional sports, tennis appears to be the cruelest to its non-stars, but we could easily say the same about golf, badminton, table tennis, squash. So what's the problem? By simply being an individual sport, most tennis players may never get to the height of success of players in team sports. In team sports such as soccer, basketball, and baseball, players get paid through a sign-on bonus and the weekly salary they receive. This alone gives players a lot more short-term financial stability because their basic pay is fixed, not performance-based. Also, they don't get to pay for their transport, coaches, or physio. Tennis players have no fixed salary, have to hire their coach, and have to earn their income by maintaining consistently high performances, or else you're at risk at facing a precipitous drop-off in earnings. While a 400th-ranked tennis player makes just about the same money as a McDonald's crew worker, and a 1,000th-ranked player probably doesn't even make it to minimum wage, mediocre and below-average soccer players earn millions just for sitting on the bench. So this is why we shouldn't compare individual sports to team sports. They are different, and it's for this same reason that top 10 player Andre Rublev couldn't afford a house as of 2021, despite earning $7.7 .7 million. Being a top player comes with way more expenses. Your trainer, physio, stringer, everyone gets a cut, and you can't buy cheap flight tickets either. The next problem has to do with stakeholders in the sport. Disunity. There are seven stakeholders in tennis, the ITF, ATP, WTA, and four Grand Slams, but they are completely fragmented. They all operate independently, all with their own media broadcast rights agreements and revenue breakdowns. A conflict of interest means that tennis as a whole doesn't do well in marketing itself. With 1.2 billion fans and being the most watched sport in the world, it's quite a shame that tennis accounts for only less than 2% of global sports media rights. Essentially, what it means is that less money trickles down to the players, and those at the bottom of the food chain bear the brunt of it all. Unfortunately, it's one of the reasons why a number of these semi-professionals have resorted to foul play like match fixing. Let's say that the total prize money for the winner in these low-tier competitions is 5k. Offering a broken desperate player 10k might literally make him think twice about agreeing to fix the match. By the way, it also occurs in other sports. Also, you might find players like Facundo Bagnus, who competed at the opening round match of the 2022 French Open with a heavily strapped right calf. Obviously injured, he struggled to move around the court, but earned $65,000 in a lopsided loss to Daniil Medvedev. Imagine having to play injured just to survive. But unlike many other sports that have a single united body, the major tennis stakeholders have failed to unite and find a common ground. The pandemic revealed these problems, and it was the tipping point for many players. And it was around that time that the Professional Tennis Players Association was launched through the efforts of Vasek Pospisil and Novak Djokovic to protect the interest of struggling players on tour, to address financial disparities and inequities in the sport, and to ensure that the players and their interests were fairly represented in the decision-making. But it's quite weird how everyone, especially the top players, didn't really buy the idea. Djokovic, who was the president of the ATP Player Council at the time, called for top players to help contribute to a fund established by the sport's governing bodies to provide money to lower-ranked players. Dominic Team 
openly criticized the idea, questioning the professionalism and work ethic of players in that situation, and stating that he would rather give his money to people or organizations that really need it. But let me ask you, what do you think of the Professional Tennis Players Association? Or maybe we were wrong the entire time. Although it would be nice to see ITF and ATP come up with better solutions for players' welfare on tour, maybe it's a little unrealistic to expect more prize money at the lowest tier of tournaments because the income is simply not there for those often untelevised and unattended poor tournaments. There could also be arguments that wealth is concentrated at the top in virtually every area of life and not just tennis alone. Just last week, it was announced that the USTA Foundation would be donating its largest sum of grant funding, totaling $4 million to 148 deserving national junior tennis and learning chapters around the country. The aim of the NJTLs is to support under-resourced youth through tennis and education. Also, starting at age 13, grants for up to $9,000 will be available again for those who reach certain age-specific benchmarks. Subsidized travel grants will also be available for American junior players, their parents, and coaches if they qualify for the Grand Slams. Even with this system in place, there are still many loopholes that might never be addressed. So what other solutions do you have in mind? A base salary for players sounds like a good idea, but it remains unclear where that money would come from in the current structure of tennis. What about prize redistribution from the top? Probably a good idea. It would also be great to see more money put into wheelchair tennis. The ATP recently announced a baseline financial security program for players taking effect in 2024. It's actually part of a three-year trial that will see the top 250 players earn more income, $300,000 for the top 100, half that amount for the next 75 players, and $75,000 for players ranked between 176 and 250. There will also be injury protection for those who play less than nine events due to injury, $100,000 for the top 100, and lesser amounts for the rest of the top 250. Finally, upcoming players will have access to $200,000 if they crack the top 125. Now, what do we make of this initiative? If your goal is to become a rich sports person, tennis should not be on the top of your list because your chances are slimmer. In a sport known for creating millionaires, paradoxically, many find it tough to make ends meet and end up with a challenging life full of uncertainty and financial insecurity. So how do you keep the dream alive with many unknowns? Luck? Skill? What else? At the end of the day, the sport is in some ways a reflection of how the real world works. Make it to the top and your income opportunities are endless, as we've come to see with the likes of Roger Federer, Rafael Nadal, and Novak Djokovic. Sadly, there will always be players like Noah Rubin, who reached a career-high world number 125, but ended up walking away from the sport to pursue opportunities in pickleball and media at age 26 because he just couldn't break even.